be there. They literally mm -hmm. were not being forced to be there, and they were thrilled to be there. And so there is there is that inner interest and excitement, and uh, and uh, we just have to think of ways to motivate not only just the kids, but the people who teach the kids mm -hmm. and the people who also write about science and the people who also show it on TV that actually people are fascinated by this if you give them a chance. Yeah. I think there are two problems with, with, with educating people about science. One is that there's the presumption that you should sell science on being useful. Now science is useful but the important thing is it's not all it is and usefulness is not the most exciting thing. A lot of people think it is. They, they sell the space program on the fact that non-stick frying pans are a spin-off. <laughs> I mean, that is so demeaning to something mm. as, as noble as mm. the space program. An, an analogy which I like is that you can appreciate music without actually being able to, do, to play, play an instrument. And a lot of people have a love of music drummed out of them by five-finger exercises on, on the piano right. when they could be listening to Mozart. And um, it, the, the, say, the equivalent to listening to Mozart is your thing about having the Nobel Prize winners coming and telling about the wonders of the universe. And similarly, in school, you don't have to teach science by getting out a Bunsen burner and, and getting people to do melt things in crucibles and things. You can teach how wonderful it is, how, how elegant it is. That's because we want also, as, as educators, we tend to want to create clones of ourselves, I think. And Brian brought up, well, we tend to think it's really important that these students have all the skills that we have but they, most of them don't need them. They're not going to be physicists or biologists. What they need is, is an understanding of the process and the wonder. And I think you were getting... I, I agree with everything, except that I think we're, we'd be deluding ourselves to think that the only reason that there's hostility to science is because there's ignorance of yeah. science. And in fact, there are studies of people who endorse evolution because they come from blue states and they like Barack Obama and they know that endorsing evolution is the correct thing to do, who actually have a rather faulty understanding of it. And I would not be surprised if the converse was true, that some of the people who are hostile to evolution probably understand at least uh, the, the core of what makes it work. People also have attached moral and uh, cultural significance to certain beliefs. And the people who are hostile to evolution are ones who think that it is incompatible with moral values, that if evolution were completely mm -hmm. true, we would be like, uh, if you teach kids their animals, they'll behave like animals, we'd be raping, we'd be uh, carrying out the dictates of our selfish genes, value, purpose, meaning would evaporate. So part of the story of science and what makes it so ennobling is that that is the, couldn't be farther from, from the uh, truth, that there is nothing uh, belittling, there's nothing uh, about science that takes away meaning and purpose and morality, uh, and that, the, that we have been, I think, doing a poor job in letting the uh, traditional religious and cultural right uh, have the franchise on meaning and morality. There has to be a way, a way of saying that the values that make science possible, such as self-examination, such as a respect for the truth, such as humility and awe and wonder uh, uh, in the face of the natural world are all ennobling. And moreover, they lead to a, a sounder morality and ethics than ones based on uh, dogma or cultural inertia. Yes, I think it's a very, very, very important point, and I, I agree very much with Stephen there. A lot of people uh, think that uh, science is reductive in the sense that, they, that you, you don't see the pearl, you only see the disease of the oyster, and somehow or other this takes all the color out of the world and all the meaning. And, and what, what you can easily uh, do is to tell people that what the 18th century Enlightenment was about was about the attempt to apply canons of rationality and, and evidence-based reasoning and, and uh, uh, you know, empirical constraints to the social sciences and, and the humanities and the business of government and thinking about the, the human good. Um, I mean, it's a, a fascinating thing about that period in time that people saw that there was a way of approaching things and thinking about things, discussing them, which would open up a, a new understanding, a new depth of understanding across the whole world. So it wasn't just a matter of the, of the natural sciences or natural philosophy, as it was called then, but it was about, the, about that whole project. And just to go back to something that Lawrence said right at the very beginning uh, uh, about the scientific community, because it's connected to this idea of the ideal, or, or not the ideal, but the, the, the uh, maximally ameliorized <laughs> sort of social setting, right. is that the astonishing thing about the scientific community is its internationalism, is the fact that it is a pure meritocracy, almost, almost a pure meritocracy. Uh, the, the, the fact that, that, that there, there is 
uh, a set of languages spoken by physicists, by biologists, whatever it might be, which enables them to communicate and share ideas, uh, to challenge one another, to test one another, uh, is a very healthy kind of competition, sometimes a little unhealthy, and people nick other people's ideas and so on, but uh, generally speaking, it's, it's a very flourishing, a very vigorous community. And if only you could generalize that to other sorts of communities, and perhaps to society at large, you know, it would be... It would be great. <laughs> For example, honesty is an absolutely cardinal um, value of, of science. The whole scientific enterprise would totally collapse if we couldn't trust each other not to fiddle our, our figures, whereas the legal profession, for example, is essentially founded on the need to <laughs> persuade, not exactly in, in, against the facts, but at least trying to make the best case you can regardless of the, of the facts. Well, now, science now, doesn't you're not, work. You're not saying that scientists are inherently more honest. I'm not saying that. No, no, no. no. I'm not saying that. Science is. Science, science forces them to be whether they are That's right. Or not. No, no, no. That, that, that's, that's right. What, that's, whatever their personal inclinations, the whole scientific <laughs> enterprise depends upon honesty in, in a way that the legal enterprise absolutely doesn't. But, but, it, but, it, but it also suffer. Oh, sorry, right. I, I would simply say, but it also has a self-correcting mechanism to yes. enforce that. Peer review and, Peer and, review and repetition of experiments. Exactly. But, but it yes. is incredibly <laughs> susceptible. And that seems to be because we trust each other. When someone does make, make a fraud, there's been a lot of examples of how far it can go because we presume honesty. We're, we're it also makes, it's, but it's, it also makes it difficult. Out, but it yeah. makes it also difficult to counter. I, I know, for example, in the context of the, of the debate against intelligent design, which I've been a bar, big part of, there are, in fact, the, uh, the Discovery Institute, which is the major proponent of intelligent design, they know very well that the end justifies the means and they're willing to distort the truth for that. And many, many scientists have a difficult time responding to that because it, it is very difficult for scientists to respond to people who are knowingly willing to to lie in order to achieve a political end. It's very difficult. Well, but, but look, let, let's, let's talk about this notion of truth, because that sounds like there's some final thing to be found. I mean, um, most scientists would subscribe to some extent to the philosopher Karl Popper's view of things, where you are constantly coming up with ideas, and then you try and falsify them. And so he would do piecemeal social engineering, and so on and so forth. I think there is an idea that the, the general public does have a gen an idea that there is some final truth to be reached. And our, our, our somehow find the enterprise wanting when they read in one newspaper that there's a new study out con con which conflicts completely yeah. with the study that came out three months ago, uh, which caused them to change their entire medication yeah. and so on and so forth. So, so there's this, 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 this conflict here between ideal... Uh, how do you explain that to people well, when you're out there? There's a large part... I think part of it is the need to sell... I, I, all of us have experienced sell. this. To sell, yeah, to sell things. I mean, to sell papers, to sell other things. So that many times a new result is jumped on, first of all, by the universities who promote it with press releases when it may not yet be ready to be reported on, the journalists who then utilize it, and, and the fact that there is, um, and the need to always think that in order to sell it, Brian and I are probably more familiar with this, in physics, everyone, every new person has to be the next Einstein. And, and, and it's, it's, if they're not, it's not supposed to be interesting to the public. And, and so we tend to, I think, in our reporting of science, uh, uh, there's a great pressure to overplay things that are tentative, because science is tentative. And, and at the front edge, a lot of the stuff we're thinking is wrong, and that's what makes it interesting. But it's very hard to convey the fact that we're debating about exciting things, which are tentative and, and will evolve, we, uh, but rather to be presented as great discoveries rather than great little steps. Uh, and, uh, I, I mean, I think there is a, a uh, tendency in science journalism to uh, publicize the latest single finding, ignoring the fact that has been shown often by statisticians that the majority of published findings are false. Yeah, exactly. Now, that doesn't mean the scientific enterprise is worthless, because uh, all unsupported conjectures are false, as opposed to only a large, uh, a slight majority of scientific findings. And of course, you accumulate scientific findings so that after there are a large number of studies and meta-analyses and literature reviews are done, the overall picture of the truth can emerge. But focusing on a single study is as, um, can be as misleading as focusing on a single anecdote. And really, there can't be... The, the, the problem with any kind of criticism of science for having... Uh, promoted findings which we later discover to be false is that it's only the standards of science that show that the earlier science <laughs> was false. And in a sense, science